Well, good morning, Bridge. It's good to see you here. Um, I am Dan Radke, and I'm a covenant partner here at the Bridge. And I am just honored this morning to have this opportunity to share God's word with you. You know, if you've been around church for a while, there's a word that I'm sure you keep hearing over and over and over again. And undoubtedly, there's been a time, maybe many times, where you've heard this word defined, you've gotten some sense of what it is. But sometimes we have this tendency to assume and, and that because I know what this word means, well, everybody must know what it means and why it matters. You might wonder at this point, well, what word are we talking about? The word is the gospel. Now, if you're here today and you're a follower of Jesus, you might think that, oh, well, we're about to get into a message that is primarily or mainly for someone who hasn't yet trusted in, in Jesus and committed to following him. And that's not a bad impulse, right? Because the gospel is a message for everybody. And it's certainly for those who have never heard it before and have not received and have not become a child of God. But what I want us to see, and I hope that we do, as we look this morning at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, as we consider Paul's words and as we, Lord willing, sense the Spirit speaking to us through his word, that the gospel is for you too. In fact, that it's meant to be this motivating factor in everything, in the day-to-day, -day, in how we make decisions, in what we do, how we parent our kids, how we speak to our spouse, how we go to school, how we work, why we work, everything. The gospel is meant to be this motivating force. If you're here today and maybe you're not sure what you think about Jesus, or maybe you know that you're not a follower of Jesus, you might hear that we're talking about the gospel and you think, oh, this guy's going to get judgy and weird and awkward and in my face. You'll be happy to know that's, that's not my purpose this morning. Really what I'm after as we look at this passage is to explain clearly, as best I can, what is the gospel and why is it not just a one-time message to hear, but it really is meant to motivate everything. Let me give you an illustration um, picture building a house, and really any kind of house will do. And we're going to say that this house is being a Christian, an illustration, right? And what I want you to think about for a moment is, what is the relationship of the gospel, this good news of what God has done in Christ for us, what is the relationship of this gospel to the house? Well, an obvious answer is, here you've got the front door, right, that the gospel is clearly the front door that you go through. I mean, if you know anything about this gospel, this good news, you know that it's all about how we become in a relationship with God, how the sin that we sense in ourselves and we sense in the world, how it's dealt with. So yes, the gospel is this front door that we go through, but is that all it is? What I want us to see this morning is that not only is it the front door, but it's also meant to be the foundation of the entire house that everything else is built on top of. And when we neglect or forget or even just simply overlook or just forget the gospel, well, it's kind of like there's these little gaps or holes in the foundation. And if you get a big enough one, the whole structure is in danger of caving in, right? Right? And I think the same can be true for us when we overlook the role of the glorious grace that we just sung about and what a difference it makes in our lives. So join with me here. We're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Um, if you have a Bible, I invite you to turn there. Um, there are Bibles right in front of you underneath the seats there. Um, if you're here today and you don't have a Bible, consider the one in front of you a gift from us to you. Or is also going to be on the screen. You can follow along. So we're going to look here at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Um, we're going to start the very first verse. I'll read through verse 11. And this is Paul, the apostle. He's writing to a church in the first century in a town called Corinth. And this is what he has for them and what he has also the Lord has for us. 1 Corinthians 15, starting with verse 1. Now, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. 
For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, or Peter, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all of the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But... By the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach and so you believed. As we begin this morning, kind of unpacking this passage, we're going to go kind of verse by verse phrases here and there. I want us to notice who Paul is writing to. Look with me here at verse 1. He says, I would remind you, brothers of the gospel. Brothers. This is a term of great affection. He's writing to the church in Corinth who are believers. And he says, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel. Now, you might think, well, If they're believers, don't they already know the gospel? And there's a sense in which, of course, they do. But he's writing to say, I want to remind you of it. What's going on in the church in Corinth is it's a church full of all kinds of issues. Um, It's a church that had all kinds of divisions. People were choosing sides among one another. It's a church that had open sexual immorality. It's a church that had an overall lack of, of love. And so Paul wrote this letter to them basically saying, hey guys, wake up. Much of what you're doing is out of step with this gospel that you've heard and received and it's made a difference in your life, but it's not done yet. At the same time, Paul has great hope for them. If you go back to the very beginning of this book, chapter 1 of 1 Corinthians, um, all the way back in chapter 1 verse 2, Here's what Paul writes to them. He says, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus or being transformed in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. And then if you go to verse four, he says, I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus. And then in verses 7 and 8, Paul continues. He's got more positive things to say. He says, You are not lacking in any gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you are called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. So Paul is clearly writing to a group of people who believe in Jesus, who know the gospel. He has a lot of things to say that this gospel that began in them, God will complete it. They will one day stand guiltless before him. So why would Paul write these reminders? It's because they needed them. Their day-to-day conduct and their lives and their decisions, well, they had forgotten or neglected or ignored the gospel. And that's often so true of every one of us, no matter who we are. We have that same danger of forgetting or neglecting or even just overlooking it. So as we look today at this passage, um, there are really four big ideas that I want you to think about and go home with. Here's the first one. The gospel has past, present, and future parts to it. Look what Paul says here. He says in verse 1, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received. So there was a point in the lives of these Corinthians in which they heard this message. They heard about their sin. They felt the weight of it. 
And the Holy Spirit used that message, applied it to their hearts, and they received it. They trusted in Jesus. Just like them, for every one of us who has trusted and follows Jesus, we have been delivered from the penalty of sin, received it, past tense. But Paul continues, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand right now. You see, because for the Corinthians, there was a decisive time in their lives where they received Christ for them. Now decisively in the present, they stand in this gospel. I don't know about you, but it's so often easy to go based on how I feel. I wake up, things are already not going well, or maybe things at work are messed up, or family, you know, kids are as cute as can be, but they don't always do the right things. And I just don't feel close to God. But if, if I'm someone who's a follower of Jesus, it's not ultimately about how I feel. I, can, I stand in the gospel not because I feel so great right now, but because of what God has done objectively, truthfully in the past. And so the Corinthians are saved in the present because of what God's accomplished in the past. But, but Paul continues. He says, I remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. There's a sense in which all of us who follow Jesus can, can say, I am being saved by the gospel. Yes, we were saved. The moment we trusted in Christ, all of our sins are forgiven. We're entered into the family of God. We're his adopted child. But our day-to-day -day life doesn't always reflect how God sees us as righteous and perfect in his eyes, right? We still have sin in our lives. And so what Paul is talking about is the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit to transform us, to sanctify us, just like he wrote to these Corinthians in the first chapter. This is a lifelong process by which we are being delivered from the power of sin. And then we see, and it's not as clear in this passage, but if you look at a passage like Romans 13, Paul clearly highlights this future aspect of the gospel. He says there in Romans 13, for salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. So there's a sense in which, yes, we were saved, we are being saved, and we will be saved fully, completely. What is he talking about? Well, he's essentially talking about that when Christ returns, even the presence of sin, even every trace of it will be done away with. And we will be transformed. And our hearts will be morally perfect like our Savior. There is a coming day that we will be finally delivered from the presence of sin. What a glorious day that will be. And so from this, we see that the gospel has both past realities, we reflect back on it, it stirs our gratitude, and it has future realities that we can look forward to what Christ will do, and then both of those are to impact the day-to-day -day that we live now, past, present, and future parts of the salvation. And, and given the church in Corinth situation, these divisions, this immorality, this lack of love, they needed reminders. And given the messiness of our lives, we too need these reminders. Well, look with me here in verses three to seven. Paul is gonna say, all right, I'm telling you, brothers, I'm gonna remind you. Don't miss it. Don't just fall asleep thinking, oh, I already got this. No, pay attention. I'm gonna remind you of this. And then he reminds us in verse three to seven, really the essential pieces of it. So look here again with me in verses three to seven. Paul says, I delivered to you as a first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter, then to the 12, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all of the apostles. 
So here Paul just goes point by point by point rehearsing these glorious truths of what God has done in Christ. But notice, and this brings up our second point, that the gospel is a message to personally receive and then to deliver to others. Paul says, this is a message that I received, Corinthians, and then I delivered to you. And then the Corinthians, in turn, get to be a part of this process. They receive it, they get to deliver it. And so do we. Think back, if you can, to the very first time that you heard about Jesus. And maybe you don't know, maybe you're very young. For some of you, it happened later in life. Some of you, it was much earlier. But wasn't it more than likely there was some person or group of people or a series of people who shared about Christ with you? Maybe they gave you a Bible. Maybe they had you over for dinner and just enjoyed a meal together. Maybe they brought you out for coffee. They did some kind of act of kindness to you. And it was a person that God used to help you to see your need for him. Well, we get the privilege, just like God used somebody in our lives, we get to be used by God in other people's lives. And we know this, right? But how is your and my, how is our passion for this? See, sometimes we act like the gospel is a message that, yes, I'm glad I have it, but I'm going to go put it in a box over here and on the shelf, and I'll look at it in the own privacy of my own life. But no, it's a message to be proclaimed. It's not meant to stay with us. It's meant to change us, transform us, and be just off the top of our lips with one another and with the world. Well, let's look at this. Um, and, and my prayer is that as we look at this, it would stir us toward greater passion, that we would know and be more grateful for God's work in our own hearts, but then just overflow into the world around us. So verse 3, looking at these elements of the gospel, Paul says, Christ died for our sins. It shows us clearly our need. You know, sin is, is a word that sometimes people in our day and age don't like to really talk about. It's so we kind of shy away from that word. But the reality is, is when we downplay the bad news, how we just sang about a few minutes ago, how we're undeserving and unworthy, when we downplay that, we really diminish the glory and the goodness of what the gospel has done for us. I mean, it's good news. I mean, that's the simple idea of the gospel. It's good news. But what is it news about and how or why is it good? You really don't see that unless you recognize that there are sins for which Christ died. But what is sin? Um, probably most of us could give an easy answer to that, but I want us to just rehearse it a little bit so we feel the weight of it once again. It is wise to refresh ourselves. So we can see the presence of sin in us and in the world around us at multiple levels. Here's one. Every one of us has this innate desire to set the agenda for our own lives. We want to be the commander, the, the captain of our own souls. We want to just figure out this is what I'm going to do. I got the right plans. We don't want God to be the Lord of our lives, the director of our lives. We have this innate sense, it's a, I want to do it. I want to make the plans. God is a creator. He knows us better than we know ourselves. He's got the right plan, but we say, I got a good one for me. I'm pretty happy with it. That's one way we see sin in our own lives. Another way we see it, and this is probably the most obvious is God has given us pretty clear instructions, rules, laws, and we ignore them, disregard them, and, and disobey them. Let me just give you two examples. These are two of the famous Ten Commandments. Um, one of them is, you shall not lie. You shall not tell falsehoods. How many of us, who among us could honestly say, I've exhaustively followed that one? I've never told even a white lie as if that's any better. Any twisting of truth makes it false. Now, you may be here this morning thinking, well, I don't think I've done that. Well, you just did it. You just broke it. You just lied. Because every one of us have failed in this way in our lives. Consider the, another one, the second one, and I'm going to paraphrase this one a little bit. Second commandment here, another one of the ten. You shall not covet your neighbor's family or stuff. 
How many of us are at times jealous for what somebody else has? Maybe it's their house, maybe it's a toy, maybe it's a, it's a piece of equipment, it's a vehicle, maybe the kind of job they have, the money they make, the people they're with, the connections they have. We all fall prey to this. We want what someone else has for ourselves. We wish that was true of us, and we kind of hope that maybe, maybe they'll even lose it. And again, if you're thinking, yeah, I've never done that in my life, well, guess what? You just broke the first one again. You just lied again. You and I, we all are guilty, and that's just two of them. But here's where it gets more devastating. Sin is not only what we do externally, which we just acknowledge we all do that. But the Bible is clear, and Jesus is clear, that sin is what's inside of us. It's our nature. It's what the Bible calls our hearts, what we desire, what we aim for, what we intend to do, what we think about, what we feel. It's this inner reality of us. Jesus makes it quite clear here in Luke chapter 10. I'm sorry, in Matthew chapter 15. When he says, but when, well, what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. And this defiles a person. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual morality, theft, false witness, slander. You see, our problem with sin isn't just that if we could just, you know, stop doing a few different things, then we'd be good. No, it's at the core of who we are. We don't desire the way we ought to desire. And so sin is devastating when we come to see what it really is. One last aspect, in case somehow you're thinking, yeah, I don't know if that's me. How about this? Um, Jesus talks about what he calls the greatest commandment in Luke chapter 10. He says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your strength, and with all your soul. Can you and I, can we honestly say that in every way, in every moment of our lives, with all that we are, we obey that? No. So we need to be reminded of how unworthy we are because when we, when we do get reminded, we start to see the good of the good news of how good God is. See, sin is, is devastating. It's far worse than we can even imagine. But here's the hope and the good news of the gospel is that as far deep as sin runs in us, his grace meets us in the very depths and lifts us out. Praise God for this. It's worse than we thought, but the good news is better than we realize, perhaps. It reaches to the depth. And so he says Christ died for our sins, back in verse 3. We need to be reminded that nothing less than the perfect, innocent Son of God on the cross, taking all of our sins upon himself, nothing less than that could forgive us of our sins and make us enter into a relationship with God. That's what it took. That's what was needed. The gospel is liberating because if we see our sin, I mean, it's devastating because we see our sin, but it's liberating because we see the depths to which God reaches to save us. Well, Paul continues. Not only does he say that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, but verse four, that he was buried, which confirms that Jesus was physically a man. He died and he was placed in a tomb. He actually died. And then he continues on that he was raised on the third day. Jesus physically rose out of that tomb. And Paul says it happened on the third day. This is one of the central truth claims of Christianity that sets it apart from any other worldview, world religion, or philosophy. We worship a God who is alive, who reigns today. We don't worship a God of long ago who died and just hopefully, thankfully, he got written down in history. No, we worship a God who is alive and is making a difference right now in our hearts and in this world and among us. 
See, the resurrection is of ultimate importance. It's the difference between truth and error, faith and unbelief, the world and the church, heaven and hell, hope and despair. All of these ride on this central historical event that happened on the third day. Christ risen from the grave. So when we talk this morning about having this good news and this grace at work in us that that should motivate our day-to-day life, we're not basing it on some myth or legend. We're basing it on the truthfulness of what happened. But notice then that Paul fleshes that out a little bit in verses 5 to 7. He talks about these appearances. People saw Jesus come back to life. And it was just as astonishing for them as it would be for us today. This doesn't happen. But he mentions all of these eyewitnesses because we could have gone, if we were living in those days, we could have gone and asked them, what happened? We could consider every one of them. Every one of them is an amazing case. But let's think about James for a moment. James was the half-brother of Jesus. And one of the things that we learn about James in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, these accounts about Jesus' earthly life and ministry and his teachings and his death and resurrection, is that James and many of the family members of Jesus thought Jesus was nuts. Why is he going around doing this? We don't believe in him. What would cause James to worship his half-brother? Well, he saw that Jesus had died, and now he's alive again. It made all the difference for James. It changed everything. And like the 12 who were in this unique position of history, they would have known, did this actually happen? Or are we just going to make it up? Because they were totally cowards when Jesus was going to the cross. They ran every other direction. They didn't stand by him. Peter kind of did, but he didn't even, he denied he even knew him. So they were in this position to know, did this happen? And knowing that it happened, and with the power of the Spirit being sent to them, they had boldness and power to go proclaim and to give their lives for this that they knew was really the case. So Christ died for our sins. He was buried. He was raised on the third day. And notice that all of this is in accordance with the Scriptures. Now, it would take a whole sermon series to really unpack what that means. But let me give you the nutshell. What this means is that from the very beginning of the Bible, all the way back in Genesis, in each book, all the way through, God's plan was unfolding that would then culminate and end in and be the focus of was Jesus, his coming to die on the cross and raise for us. In other words, this wasn't God's plan B, like he got surprised by some things along the way. No, this has been God's plan all along, to redeem a people for himself. And this leads us then into this third point about the gospel that I want to have you consider this morning, is that the gospel is to have first place in our lives. Notice what Paul says there at the very beginning of of verse 3. I delivered to you as of first importance. This message is meant to make all the difference. And it does make all the difference. Nothing is to be more important to us and shape us more in how we live than this glory of what God has done and who we see him revealed to be. So what What gets us up in the morning? What motivates our decisions? What guides how we parent our children or discipline them or play with them or how we interact with our spouse, how we go to school, how we work at our jobs and why we do these things, why we work hard even when someone's not watching or even when people are annoying us? How can we know what's motivating us? Well, Jesus gives us some clarity in Matthew 6, He says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. In other words, where we spend our time, our resources, our energy, our talents, our money, all reflects what we truly value within the core of who we are, our hearts. So when you and I, when we have a spare moment, how do we spend it? What do we do with it? 
When we have a few extra dollars that was additional to our budget, where does it go? For what does it get spent on? When we wake up in the morning, what is that first thought? Or when we have a time of, oh, I can relax for a minute. What do we start dwelling on? Is it Christ? Is it the gospel? Or is it a million other things? And if we're honest this morning, if I'm honest this morning, it's often a million other things, right? It's, it's something going on at work that just isn't right. It's frustrating. It's stressful. It's maybe something going on at home, you know? Again, the kids are cute, but they don't always make the right decisions, and that's stressing you out. Maybe it's a loss that you're experiencing. Whatever the case, and, and not that any of these things are bad in of themselves, but, but when we think of them, what gives us clarity as to how to think of them and, and where to go next and what to do and what's going to step us out of our comfort zone to do the thing that would honor God? Is it the gospel? It's meant to have first place in our lives. Then we look here in verses 8 to 11, and, and Paul, the first part of it, continues this appearances when he says, last of all, as to one untimely born, he or Christ appeared also to me. And then in verses 9 to 11, Paul is going to reflect on who is he because of what Christ has done in his life. Who is he? He's going to be honest about his past and honest about who he is now. And this leads us to the fourth and final big idea that we're going to see about the gospel is that the gospel reshapes our identity and service. Notice how it does this for Paul, right? He says in verse 9 that I am the least of the apostles. I am unworthy. Well, why is that? Well, Paul gives us a very obvious, clear reason. If you know his story, he persecuted the church of God. Paul did everything in his power to snuff out this early church. It's really no exaggeration to say that he was in the ancient world an ancient equivalent of some kind of an ISIS or other terrorist member today. His aim, because he thought he was zealously pursuing God, was to snuff out this new early church. But because of the grace of God, Paul went from the persecutor to the proclaimer of this message that he had tried to eliminate. He failed. God was greater. But notice the work. But Paul is just reflecting. It's, it's kind of like as Paul's now thinking about this, it's like he's wearing these glasses. And, and it's like the, the glasses, these lenses, could have the word gospel on them. He thinks about his story. He thinks about his past, his, his, his sins. He thinks about what God has done to make him who he is and his labors and successes, his failures, all of it. And he's got these gospel lenses. He sees all of reality through the grace of God that he was so unworthy of. We just sing that we're undeserving and unworthy. And our story looks different than Paul's. But do we truly believe that? Do we feel the weight of it? That we don't come to God and say, oh God, you ought to love me. I'm pretty good looking. I'm pretty great. No, do we feel the weight of, I don't deserve it. I'm unworthy. But how good, how amazing is God that he would, while we are still sinners, send Christ and Christ would die for us. Look with me here as, as, as Paul's identity is reshaped. He's got humility. He says he's the least and he's unworthy. He's got honesty regarding past sin. He confesses, hey, I persecuted the church. He's actively turned away from sin. He says, I persecuted, but now I am what I am and I labor. He has gratitude for God's grace and rejoices to see its work in his life. He says, God's grace was not in vain to me. He doesn't claim credit for a changed life. I mean, did you, did you see, he, it almost seems like he does, where he says, I worked harder than any of them. You're like, whoa, Paul, are you boasting? But really what he's getting at is, I was so far behind, I was so unworthy, I worked harder than any of them. But then he goes on to clarify, it's not I, but the grace of God that is with me and through me. He doesn't give the credit to himself. 
God is the hero of Paul's story. You know, when people look at our day-to-day life and they, they're to, you know, just be a fly on the wall and analyze everything we say, everything we do, what would they conclude is the thing or person that we live for? Who, are, who have we made the hero in our story? Self? Some thing we're going after? Maybe another person? The only one worthy is Christ as the hero of our story. So God's transforming grace, it gave Paul a new identity. It gives us a new identity. But it also empowered, emboldened Paul to labor and to serve. You know, sometimes we we have this idea that, well, if we really focus on God's grace, then we just kind of sit back and just, you know, God, you do everything. You're going to show up. I'm just going to sit back and I'm not going to really have any part of it because you're just going to do it all. And God does show up and God does amazingly beyond what we can think or imagine. But he uses us in that process. God's grace doesn't replace our efforts. It empowers our efforts. To be clear, we're not made right with God because of them. And God is not more pleased with us because all of a sudden we're really good today. No, that's all grace. That's all because of what Christ did. But it doesn't cause us to just sit around and do nothing. It causes us, as we reflect on this grace, as it works in us, it causes us to be about the Lord and his work in every area of life. It transforms us, it changes us, and it changes how and why we do what we do. The last thing I want us to see here is looking at verse 10 in this passage. He says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. What Paul is saying is that what God wanted to do with Paul, he's actually doing. He's actually accomplishing it. You ever feel like, ah, is God going to use me? I messed up. I don't know if I can make this right. I don't know if I can ever be useful for God again. Or maybe you're having a decently good day or good week or good month, but you, you wish you could do more. Is God's grace toward me, is it worth it? Is it going to do what he wants it to do? And Paul is saying, yes, it will accomplish everything that God desires for it. Paul would write in Philippians, he'd say that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion at the day of Christ. Remember Paul said to the Corinthians, you're going to stand guiltless. Yes, you have sins right now that you need to figure out. You need these gospel reminders. But if you truly follow Jesus, you're going to stand guiltless. His grace toward you is not in vain. So press in and hold on and dwell on it and go the next step as the Spirit leads you and transforms you and moves you along. So in this passage, we've, we've gotten this privilege of seeing this good news. And probably by now, I sound like a broken record. Gospel, gospel, gospel. I hope that hasn't been off-putting to you. There's many ways you can say it. But again, it's not just, not only that past we've been saved when we trusted in Christ, but it's an ongoing thing. We're being saved as we apply the Bible and prayer and fellowship with one another and sharing with others, we apply all of these tools and resources God's given us. He grows us. We're being saved through those. And then one day we can await this glorious day when Christ comes back. We will become fully like him in our hearts. Remember the illustration that I shared at the beginning about this house? Yes, the gospel is that front door, but it's the foundation. And when we neglect it, forget it, overlook it, there are holes building up. We don't want to be in danger of having it caved in, of missing out on the joy it is to serve Christ in the day-to-day and what he wants to do with us. But I want us to consider for a moment, what happens, what if this gospel, this good news, this grace of God, what if that's not what drives us as followers of Jesus? What else tends to become the main thing for us if it isn't this gospel? I want to share with you uh, six different things very quickly. 
Um, disclosure, I, I, I got these from Paul Tripp, so I didn't come up with these. In his class, How People Change, which is a class that we offer here at the bridge, if you've never taken that, you really should. Um, if, you, if any of you are thinking, man, I wish you got more specific, more practical here this morning, Paul Tripp does that. He's a master of it. Um, I'm too abstract. I apologize. But Paul Tripp brings it home even more. And so in this series, um, he talks about it, and he has these six different things. And by the way, if you can't wait for that series, it's not too late to join the explicit gospel class. Um, yeah, you've missed the first three weeks, but there's really good stuff. And that speaker, too, drives it home. So here are six things that can take the place of the gospel. Every one of these, we have to be careful, every one of these has truth in it. But what they do is they reduce reduce the gospel to something less than what it fully is. So let me go through these quickly. The first one, the gospel can get reduced to simply participating in the scheduled meetings and ministries of the church. We show up, we think, oh, I did my time, I go away, I'll do it again next week. Should we come? Absolutely. But the gospel isn't just coming. We also sometimes, the second way, we reduce the gospel to simply carefully keeping the rules or we make it into legalism. We think that it's all about a list of do's and don'ts and we lose sight of the whole relationship. Now, to be clear, God is God and we're not. And he's our creator and he knows what's best for us and he clearly gives us things to obey and listen and walk in and change and transform. But all of that is in the context of grace and a relationship. It's not simply about keeping a list and then feeling good. Yes, I got my three things in today. These three good things. It's more than that. The gospel sometimes gets reduced to simply mere knowledge of the Bible. I study it. I fill my head. It's so many good things. And then I put it down. And it's not making a difference. We're to soak it up. We're to learn. We're to grow. We're to learn all kinds of things. But all of that is then to be transforming our hearts, to mold us to greater love toward one another, everyone around us. It's meant to shape us. The knowledge is meant to move us toward worship and love. Another way, the gospel sometimes gets reduced to healing emotional needs. We kind of view Jesus like our big therapist. We just vent at Jesus. We just tell him everything that's wrong. We don't really want to hear from him. We just want to tell him. And we really hope that he'll just give us some greater self-esteem. But we reduce the gospel. And lastly, perhaps we reduce the gospel by simply making it about fun and fellowship. Just gathering together, having a great time. Now, all of that is good. I mean, there's a lot of joy in hanging out with fellow believers. But it's more than just hanging out. Again, every one of these things has truth in it. And so it makes sense that for certain people, oh, this one is really the, ma the ma major thing for, for all of life. Every one of them has truth, but by themselves, they reduce the gospel. And ultimately, if you go through all of them, they make the gospel about self, about me. It's about what I want to do or don't do. It's about what I'm going to attend or not attend. It's about who I hang out with. Or It's all about self and our choices. And it's not about the glorious Christ Who's at work to transform us and to move us and to shape us and to lead us out into the world. Living, proclaiming, sharing the gospel, God's grace. So I hope this morning that your heart has been stirred and you've been convinced that even if you haven't figured it all out, the gospel is for everybody. Profound ways. Let's pray.